morning. Welcome. I'm Rusty Barber, Director of Iraq Programs here at the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, uh, in the three years that I have been associated with the Iraq Program, uh, half of which was spent in Iraq, it's hard to uh, it's hard to remember a time that was or a period that was uh, more fraught with importance and significance. Uh, for Iraq, uh, certainly I dare say not since the last elections, 2005, um, in terms of what uh, the, the uh, uh, election process and now the government formation process that Iraq has uh, embarked upon in terms of what its uh, impact will be uh, for Iraq going forward, for the region, uh, in fact, for the world. Um, now, of course, I think it's fair to say that as they do so, they do so in a context that is markedly improved in many respects in terms of security, in terms of the functionality of, uh, to some extent, of government institutions. And certainly, of course, you have a, uh, the U.S. military and, occupi and occupation forces withdrawing. Um, Iraqis now own their own political uh, uh, context, their own political environment, um, their own governance. And yet the path ahead uh, is very fraught itself. Uh, with questions, potential conflicts, actual conflicts. Uh, in the rough and once the rough and tumble of this uh, government formation process is over, what type of, of government will Iraqis get? Uh, will Sunnis find that their uh, embrace of the election uh, of electoral politics is justified by the government that they get, the degree to which it is inclusive of their participation? Um, will the system uh, of spoils known as Mahasasa persist that is to some extent institutionalized some of the ethno-sectarian differences in the, in the country, uh, and certainly as late as just yesterday with the uh, announcement of a partial recount of election votes in Baghdad, there are major uncertainties in this formation, questions about stability, questions about whether democracy can survive in Iraq, um, how are the na what role are the neighbors playing, uh, and on and on. Uh, so many, many complex questions. Fortunately, we have a an excellent uh, panel here to address all of these questions and many more that I know that uh, you all will uh, pose. It's a very well-informed group uh, here today. Um, so what I'm going to do is to first uh, introduce each of our panel guests and then ask them to give a brief presentation. And give, considering we have uh, so much to get through and we want to get to your questions, uh, we'll move right on to the Q&A. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our co-hosts. Uh, the Institute for the Study of War, um, represented here by Marissa Cochran uh, Sullivan. Uh, of course, I, I plead guilty to, the, to a certain affinity for the optics of uh, the Institute for the Study of War and U.S. Institute of Peace hosting an event of this nature. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we're delighted to have um, uh, Marissa with us. Uh, Marissa is currently uh, the research manager at the Institute uh, for the Study of War, where she supervises uh, uh, research on both Iraq and Afghanistan, and prior to that, she served as the command historian for multinational force Iraq, and she has just returned, literally, uh, from Baghdad and from uh, Nineveh and points south, as far south as Basra, so we're going to be looking uh, to her for an overview of the situation and a sort of fresh from the, from the, fr uh, from the fray uh, perspective. Uh, we also have... Uh, uh, my former uh, colleague and, and, and good friend, uh, Randal Rahim, who uh, is uh, currently the executive director of the Iraq Foundation here in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, she was a fellow here at the Institute. Um, and then before that, she was the uh, representative uh, of the Iraqi government here in Washington from uh, 2003 to 2004. She is also uh, ha brings with her uh, the experience of having been a candidate in this election on the Arakia list. Uh, welcome, Rend. Uh, we very much look forward to your perspectives uh, on the situation in Iraq. Uh, we have also with us uh, Joost Hilterman of the International Crisis Group, who is a very well-respected uh, expert on uh, Iraq, uh, Iraqi um, affairs, and I have benefited much from reading uh, your essays and your, uh, in your uh, treatises on Iraqi politics. Uh, he is currently the Deputy um, Middle East and North Africa Program Director at ICG and uh, with a special focus on uh, uh, po political and constitutional developments in Iraq, the Kurdish question, and political trends in the region. 
Uh, I will be asking him to talk a little bit about also mm -hmm. not about just about Kurdish Arab affairs and relations and the impact of the elections on those, but also the role that the regional that the neighbors are playing in uh, Iraq's uh, political process now. And finally, we have my current colleague Jeremiah Pam. Jeremy uh, served as the uh, U.S. Treasury Attaché in Iraq from 2006 to 2007, and he is currently a visiting scholar here at the Institute with the Center of Sustainable Economies. Um, thank you. Welcome, Jeremy. Uh, and with that, I will turn the podium over to our first speaker and co-host, Marissa. Thank you so much, Rusty, and thanks again for all of you for coming out this morning. Um, as Rusty mentioned, I did just return from Iraq where we spent uh, in a matter of about 10 days time uh, going from Mosul down to Basra, and we got a good perspective. We were primarily looking at the security situation, although we did um, spend time looking at the politics as well, because that's unavoidable at this time and something that we're, I'm keenly interested in. Um, so before I, I go through some of my key takeaways, I think it's just worth um, talking a little bit about the four main blocks that you're seeing with government formation, um, the fact that no coalition won a majority of seats, therefore alliances are going to be uh, important to determine who will get to the 163 majority needed uh, in the Council of Representatives. Um, quickly, the, the four main blocks are Iraqia, which won 89 seats plus two compensatory seats, um, 91. And I should mention that this is based upon the uh, uncertified election results. Now, as, as was mentioned, or as a, uh, was announced yesterday, there is going to be a manual recount of votes in Baghdad. And I think this is going to be uh, particularly uh, important for um, not just stability, because this, again, this is, does throw into, um, throw open uh, some of the, the results uh, from Baghdad, but also to the numbers, because Baghdad was quite close. And uh, it's an important uh, province that had the most number of seats. So I think this is going to delay the certification of the results, uh, which we were expecting to happen uh, towards the end of this month. And I'm not, I'm not sure now what the manual recount is going to mean for that. Um, as I mentioned, Iraqia is, is, came in, in first uh, with the uncertified results with 91 seats. Um, it is led by Ayad, Ayad Alawi, who is a secular Shia, although the list is predominantly Sunni. Um, one of the things that that I notice is that this list is, is perhaps one of the most susceptible to fracturing, although in my engagements um, we were messaged that as of right now it's still, um, it, it is, you know, showing solidarity. Um, and that was something that I was watching for um, and that other parties are looking to do to looking to fracture Iraqi and different components of it. Um, but thus far uh, they do seem to be showing solidarity. Uh, the second uh, main block is uh, State of Law, which is led by the current Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki. Um, Maliki is by far the dominant force on the list. He won by far the most number of votes for, uh, on his list. And the, the party, though it's comprised primarily of uh, Shia parties, many of them are, uh, do have ties directly to Maliki. So he is by far the dominant force on the list. Um, he does seem to be pushing uh, right now for an alliance uh, with the uh, Iraqi National Alliance, which is a, another predominantly Shia alliance, as well as the Kurds. Um, although he, he has run into some difficulty with this because there is concern over Maliki, um, over Maliki's um, actions in recent years and over what, uh, what would happen if he were to retain his post as prime minister. So he has run into some difficulty, but you are still seeing efforts to, uh, on the part of state of law to, um, to form an alliance with the uh, INA and the Kurds. Um, again, it remains to be seen whether you're going to uh, whether he'll offer some concessions uh, in exchange for that alliance. Uh, the third uh, with main block, which I mentioned, is the Iraqi National Alliance. They won uh, a total of 70 seats uh, with the uncertified results. Um, there are two main components, and this is interesting because uh, whereas before uh, ISKI had been uh, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, uh, which is led by Amr al Hakim, had been uh, the dominant the predominant force within. Uh, what was then the United Iraqi Alliance uh, beforehand. What you've seen as a result of the elections is that the Sadrs have actually emerged uh, as the more dominant bloc within, within the alliance. They won 38 seats in comparison to Iski and Badr's uh, 18 seats total. So this has changed the dynamics within, within the INA. Um, it, it is, um, somewhat changed their approach to election formation. The Sadrs have been adamantly resistant to Maliki as prime minister, which is, uh, something that they've, they've retained as a, as a uh, so to speak, red line. 
although we'll have to see what happens as government formation continues. Um, and the, the open list system really exposed some weaknesses uh, with ISKI and Botter, and it actually did, um, it, and it, that combined with the SADRA's sophisticated approach to how they, how they, um, how they ran uh, in elections uh, on election day was a result of, uh, resulted in what you saw with the, the imbalance now uh, in favor of the SADRAs. Um, and finally, the Kurds. Well, the Kurds didn't run on a uh, united list. You actually saw the KDP and the PUK run on the Kurdistan Alliance, whereas other smaller groups such as Garan, which is the uh, splinter <coughs> party uh, from the PUK, uh, as well as the Kurdistan Islamic Union and Kurdistan Islamic Group, some smaller parties run separately. Um, what you've had since the election is the uh, coming together of all these groups under a unified stance, and this happened within uh, the last uh, two weeks or so. So you can expect that with uh, you know, the approach to government formation that the Kurds will take a unified stance um, as they uh, negotiate with other parties. So that's, that's kind of where, uh, where things stand right now and the, the key players as we discuss uh, um, government formation today. Just wanted to run through that. In terms of what I saw on the ground, all parties are talking to one another. Um, they're, that's not to say that all parties are, are interested in allying with one another, but they're all, they're all talking. Um, my sense was that the serious negotiations have, uh, have not yet begun, that you, probably, you won't see uh, serious negotiations or announcements until after the votes are certified. That was, that was uh, the sense I came away with. Um, but there's been a flurry of, of meetings uh, on, on all sides, and there's also been a flurry of visits to regional capitals, which is um, not surprising but, but worrisome, I think, um, because regional actors have taken a keen interest in what's going on, and they are seeking to shape the outcome of the government formation process. Um, and you did initially see some attempts to broker an alliance between State of Law, the INA, and the Kurds. Um, and this, this, you know, picked up immediately after the vote. It fizzled a bit. You're now seeing it again uh, uh, emerging as a common theme in uh, statements and, and meetings. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical right now because there's a, there, there's a lot of um, issues that st will still need to be resolved if this, is gonna, if this alliance is going to com come to pass. I mean, much is going to hinge on the allocation of key positions, uh, particularly the prime minister, uh, and it's going to depend on whether or not Maliki is continuing to push uh, that he remain prime minister. As I said, m a number of parties are, are, are not open to this uh, possibility. And uh, it's not just the prime minister, but the allocation of other key ministries uh, and key positions. For example, the President, uh, the Speaker of the Council of Representatives, and key ministries such as Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Oil, Ministry of Electricity. So there's a number of, of key positions that are, that are um, going to need to be allocated, and this is going to uh, cause churn. And at the same time, you've also seen statements uh, affirming the need to include Iraqia. And they did win uh, the most seats uh, in, in, the, in the vote, and so to cut them out um, in such an alliance, um, like an ISKI uh, Shia alliance, I think would have detrimental effects for stability uh, on the ground. Uh, because, the, and I do think that uh, the government that forms should be reflective of the will of the voters. Uh, in, that does include uh, participation from Iraqia. They did uh, win support of many, uh, many Iraqi voters. Um, so. I think the most important takeaway from all of this is that this is only the beginning of the government formation process. I think this is going to take uh, weeks and months to unfold. I think, it, and it's not just about the allocation of positions, but it's actually a uh, you know, discussion to determine key uh, aspects of the Iraqi state, issues such as the, the powers of the prime minister, the powers of the parliament, the role of the central government versus the provinces, even constitutional issues uh, need to be interpreted during this time. So. I don't think that, it, that it's just going to be about trading seats, and I don't, actually don't think that it should be about that. I don't think the process should be rushed so that it just becomes something of, you know, I'll give you support if you give me this seat. I think it is in the interest of Iraq to have a, a debate on these issues uh, and one, that is not, uh, one that's not rushed, and, and so you just get backroom deal, deals cut. Uh, but leaves unresolved some key issues uh, of the nature of the Iraqi state. It is un this is an unprecedented time. Uh, this is the first transfer of power under the current constitution. So I do think it's an important uh, step uh, forward uh, in Iraq's democracy. So those are some of my key uh, key points in terms of stability. On the whole, security is is quite good. Um, I know that you s you had seen in the in the papers uh, some recent attacks, particularly in late March, 
Um, but putting those in perspective, uh, the last three months have been the, uh, have had the lowest number of civilian casualties since 2003. So I think there's no question that security is, is on the whole tremendously improved, and that's with the Iraqi security forces at the helm. Uh, the Iraqi security forces have uh, had um, complete, uh, have been in the lead since January of 20, 2009, and the U.S. forces have uh, been stationed outside of the city since June. So Iraqi security forces are in the lead, and you have not seen uh, a degradation in security. So I think that that's important. But this is still a very fragile time. You still do have enemy groups that are operating. You still do have um, efforts to intimidate, uh, intimidate but whether it's political or, or otherwise during this time. Uh, so I, this is going to require continued uh, aggressive action by the Iraqis uh, with the support of the U.S. And you've seen that uh, yesterday or two days ago with the uh, raid up in Tikrit that uh, resulted in the death of uh, Abu Ayyub al-Masri, the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Omar uh, al-Baghdadi, another AQI leader. Um, my last point is, is uh, I think it's worth decoupling the discussion of the troop withdrawal down to 50K by, the, by 1 September from government formation because we are on a, a glide path that's very clear from, from my trip that, that there's no reason why we won't get to 50K by 1 September. So I don't think it's useful to uh, combine the two discussions and try to rush government formation so that it does not uh, throw off the 50K withdrawal. We're gonna get there. I think that you should decouple these two discussions because they are, they are separate uh, discussions and I, and I think that we need to have patience with regard to government formation because it's, it's important to, that, it, that it's done right. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you, uh, Marissa. That was, that was an excellent uh, primer to the discussion, and I think uh, tees up Randa Rahim very well. Uh, Randa, if you could drill down for us, down to what it looks like and looked like on the ground during the election, and, and if you could, if you could uh, speak from the sp podium, if I could prevail on you, because the, the, unfortunately our friends at the back of the room behind the cameras are having a little trouble. No, that's okay. <laughs> <coughs> we just need to be able to capture you. Yes, it's on. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, always pleased to be at USIP. I feel very at home here. Um, although I ran on uh, a Raqqa list, uh, I'm going to try and be to be as objective and impartial as possible uh, in my presentation. I'm going to try and make it analytical uh, and not biased. But uh, I'm going to start with a few facts and figures, which probably many of you know. Um, as you may be aware, out of the 325 uh, new p uh, parliamentarians that have, were voted in, only 62 were in the previous parliament. 213 previous parliamentarians were actually ousted, and uh, only 62 made it back. So we have uh, a lot of fresh blood in the parliament. Uh, some of some very major figures who uh, were well-known names in the previous administration, previous parliament, uh, lost their seats. Let me just mention a few that people at USIP may know. Uh, Hajim al-Hassani, who was at one point uh, Speaker of Parliament. Muwafaq al-Rubai, who was uh, uh, at, uh, for a long period of time, actually, Iraq's National Security Advisor. Uh, Mithal al-Alusi, who gained uh, a lot of repute, uh, repute in Iraq as a Sunni politician who told the truth to power. Many very prominent people lost their seats. Uh, there were 82, there are 82 women in the new parliament, which is exactly 25%, although it's also worth mentioning that 21 of these women actually um, got their seats not through the co uh, quota system, but because they uh, managed to get sufficient votes to get in on their own merit. 71 new members of parliament are under the age of 40. The minimum age for parliamentarians is 30 years. 71 new members <coughs> are between the ages of 30 and 40. 25 of these youngsters are women. Uh, we saw a consolidation of the political currents or political parties. In the 2005 elections, 11 um, political groups got seats in parliament, of which I believe only two were Kurdish and nine were Arab. In the 2010 elections, nine groups got seats in parliament, 
four of which were Kurdish, and only five were Arab groups. So there is a lot of consolidation uh, and, and less fragmentation. 90% uh, of voters voted for candidates, not for lists. Uh, in the provincial election, 73% voted for candidates. In these elections, it was even higher, although I should uh, point out that many of those voted for the head of the list. So that sort of tempers it a little bit. Um, and what was very interesting, as Marissa noted, was the rise of the Sudris as a power, a new power, uh, probably the new kingmakers. I, as far as my numbers uh, go, I know that they've won 40 seats in, uh, in Parliament, whereas the um, Kurdish bloc, the Kurdish alliance, that is PUK plus KDP, KDP, won 43 seats. And the Sudris then become the largest single Arab bloc in Parliament. All of this is very interesting. Uh, now, the view during the elections was, during the campaign, was that these are watershed elections for Iraq. And nobody was under any misapprehension about the importance of these elections. Um, it was fought bitterly. It was I was not a candidate in two thousand in the two thousand five elections, but I was quite involved in the election campaign in another capacity. And I can say that this these elections in two thousand and ten were much more vicious, uh, much more contentious, much more adversarial than the two thousand and five campaign. Uh, partly because everybody saw them as um, formative, decisive. Um, they are going to define Iraq's future in ways that Marissa pointed out. We have elect issues that affect Iraq's future that are going to be decided by the new parliament and the new government in a way that wasn't yet apparent in 2005. Uh, in addition, I think they were very adversarial and very vicious because the political parties felt, particularly in the, within the Arab groups, but I don't, I don't have as much a, of a sense of what it was like in the Kurdish region, but in the Arab part of Iraq, there was a sense that you were either in or dead. In other words, there was no life, no political life after the elections. It, if you didn't win, you didn't win big, you lost big. Um, now, the elections, and, and I think I'm justified in saying so, was really fought principally between Maliki's state of law and Ayad Allawi's Iraqiya. And the reason I say this is that in the South, because uh, state of law had won fairly uh, decisively in the provincial elections, they controlled the provincial council councils. With all the advantages of incumbency that that offers uh, in the southern provinces, the uh, state of law was not very worried about uh, Iski in the south. It was more worried about the Sudris. The Sudris exhibited a phenomenal degree of organization, uh, and, and that explains their, their big win. So state of law really felt that the Sudris were its main main challenge in the south and, uh, south and not Iski, and it did go after the Sudris. A lot of Sudris during the election campaign and the lead up to the elections were arrested, were harassed, and so on and so forth, and they, of course, uh, complained uh, very loudly about this. But the major battle was, in many ways, in Baghdad. Baghdad was the undecided city. Uh, this is where the campaign was at its fiercest, fiercest and this is where uh, Maliki uh, and the state of law had to fight Ayad al uh, uh, the, the, the hardest. And I think this is why we're having the recount in Baghdad rather than anywhere else. Um, and of course, Baghdad also commands the largest number of seats. It has 70 seats, two of which are for minorities, but 68 come through the normal voting process. Um, the, uh, so Baghdad was the sort of, the, the Baghdad was the swing factor, if you want, in, in these elections. Uh, the Iraqiya was um, hit very hard by a number of factors. The major one, I would say, first of all, the general harassment and of Iraqi members, both in the south and in Baghdad, particularly in the south. The, 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 
the tools of power, the organs of power, kept the Sabris down, kept Iraqia down in the south. But the major tool that was used against Iraqia was debathification. And the Commission on um, uh, whatever it's called, justice and, uh, justice and accountability. Thank you. It's such a mouthful. I can never, I can never think. I mean, I find it very hard to think of it calmly. Let's put it this way. Um, uh, just as a sort of in between sort of parenthesis, uh, um, and, and I know there is media, but this is not for the record. I do think that the whole operation of that commission was completely politicized. But whatever, however that may be, uh, that was the major tool that was used against uh, the Ira Iraqiya. Now, the debathification process was, I don't think, instigated by Maliki. It was instigated by others. However, it happened to serve Maliki's pur purpose infinitely well. And uh, it did damage uh, Iraqia considerably, both in Baghdad and in, this, in the south. Um, I want to move on to the post-election period. Just, just one, more, one more point. In the process of the elections, as you know, the elections were held in, on March 7th. Uh, the preliminary final results were declared by the IHEC on March 26th. Now, this sounds like a long period of time, but in fact, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the 2005 elections, the elections were held on December 15th, the, uh, the, the results were announced on January 22nd. So three weeks is not, uh, or slum, somewhat less, is not a very long period of time. But the accusations of uh, uh, tampering and election fraud began even during the campaign, even before the elections was, were taking place because of the way that the um, election um, the, the, the voting centers were deployed and so on and so forth. But certainly immediately after the elections, there was a great deal of talk about um, tampering with the results, tampering with the, with the ballots and so on. I want to move very quickly to the post-election period to look at, to pick up really where uh, Marissa has uh, sort of uh, uh, left off. I, I think the, the uh, recount in Baghdad, uh, Dan Sewa asked me provocatively why shouldn't election recount in Baghdad be that, that momentous or bad. Uh, the reason it is is that because uh, Maliki has from the start, as soon as Maliki realized that he may not be, his state of law may not be, uh, not, may not gain the, the, the highest number of votes uh, of seats in parliament, he began to assail the results of the elections. And he began to talk about a recount and he began to, to uh, cast doubt about the entire election process and in fact asked for a recount throughout the country. Um, so, and has already, by the way, yesterday, or in fact the day before, Maliki announced that a recount will definitely give a state of law four additional seats in Baghdad, which will be taken away from the Iraqiya. He made that <coughs> statement at a press conference. So he's already predicted the result of the recount. Um, what Maliki wants to do is to, given the, the deadlock in the negotiations and the coalition building and the resistance that has been shown by the other parties to a, a second term for, hi, uh, for, uh, for him as prime minister, he wants to present the country with uh, the concept of an inevitable fate. In other words, uh, you don't like me, but you're going to have to lump me. If I get 93 seats in parliament by every consideration by every interpretation of the of the constitution which had been in question by every interpretation i should be allowed to form the government so it's a sort of inescapable fate that he wants to present the country with um, the we are in a current stalemate in terms of negotiations marissa said we have to form a co coalition uh, that gets 163 votes in parliament um, 50 percent plus 0 0.5 as it happens um, we have a situation of wheels within wheels and a, a, a really impossible attempt to bring, to reconcile fo foes, quell ambitions, avoid polarizing policies and personalities, seek common denominators, ensure, ensure a degree of mutual trust, all of which is a, 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 a 
Sisyphean task, as far as I can, as, as far as I can see. Uh, it's a huge, or I should say Herculean, because hopefully we will get there in the end. Um, so it is, it is a very difficult task. Um, the, 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 the real knot is that you have to form this super coalition to ensure votes. Uh, Maliki has been pushing for forming a coalition before discussing who is going to become prime minister, who is going to become president, who is going to become speaker of parliament. The response to him has been, no, we will not do so. We are going to first discuss who's going to become prime minister, who's going to become president, who's going to become uh, uh, speaker of parliament, and we're going to discuss the, the distribution of important portfolios in the government before we decide whether to go into coalition with you or not. This has been the sort of vicious circle. Um, everybody recognizes that, what, that Maliki is trying to cling to power and um, they have been driving hard bargains, which Maliki, including that Maliki should not uh, renew as prime minister, Maliki has so far not accepted to relinquish that, relinquish that post, and uh, he has even told his, uh, there were reports yes, as early as yesterday, that he has told his, his uh, Dawa party that none of them should um, present himself as an alternative from the Dawa. Um, now, let's look at, break it down a little bit more, and if I have a little yes. time. Um, let's look at the possible alliances. Uh, the obvious one, would, not the obvious one, but the one that is being worked on and the one which I venture to submit is uh, blessed and encouraged by Iran, for example, is an alliance between the state of law uh, and the Iraqi National Alliance. But that is becoming a case of the, almost the case of the irresistible force meeting the immovable object. Uh, the problem is that the ISKI, uh, ISKI within INA, does not trust Maliki. Um, they've uh, seen him marginalize them. They've seen him beat them in provincial councils and in, in these elections. And they're generally distrustful of him. Plus, there is a traditional rivalry between Dawa and, and ISKI. But the real problem are the Sadris, and Muqtada Sadr specifically. Muqtada Sadr has been adamantly opposed to a Maliki premiership. And more recently, in fact on Sunday, he has said that he will not even accept any alternative from the Dawa party, from Maliki's party. He was not going to accept. Um, the Sudris are uh, bitterly um, bruised by, by Maliki. Not only did he um, uh, attack them in Basra in 2008, he also attacked them in Sadr City. He has also been rounding them up and imprisoning them. He made a promise to Muqtada Sadr to release many of them and has failed on his promise. Um, the Sadris and Iski both also see Maliki as somebody who came into power as a compromise candidate <coughs> from within the earlier Shia alliance, the much larger Shia alliance, that they, in a sense, handed him the premiership as a, a compromise uh, candidate. And he very quickly excluded them, very quickly concentrated power in his hands and in the hands of a few Dawa party members, and that they've been shut out. So Muqtada Sadr is very uh, opposed, strongly opposed. Um, and Maliki yesterday um, announced that his discussions with the INA were sterile. So we have an impasse. That doesn't mean that there won't be a bit breakthrough. But right now, we really are uh, in an impasse. The, um, an alliance between state of law and um, INA, anyway, needs a major Sunni player. You cannot marginalize the Sunnis. They've all been saying, we can't do without Iraqiya. But what they really mean is that we can't do without elements from the Iraqiya. In other words, they don't have to take Iraqiya as a package with Alawi and so on and so forth. Uh, what they would like to do, especially state of law, what state of law would like to do is unpack the Iraqiya and, and as Marissa suggested, break it up and take away elements um, 
include, you know, they, these could be Najafi, these could be Saleh al-Mutlaq, Tariq al-Hashimi, and so on and so forth. Uh, so far, I would agree with Marissa that Iraqi has held together. And uh, I think partly because they realize that their strength is in holding together and that if they then make separate deals with Maliki, he is going to impose his will upon them rather than the other way around, and that they may find themselves back to the situation in early 2008 when they were in government with Maliki and he quickly shut them out and, and kicked them out. So, but, but the state of law would like to break Iraqiyya and pull the Sunni, the heavyweight Sunnis from Iraqiyya into the fold. What about an alliance between INA, that is Iski and Sadri, and Alawi? Uh, <laughs> that's a possibility. They've been talking constructively for weeks and weeks and weeks, certainly since the elections were held. Uh, and there have been a few breakthroughs. Uh, Ammar al-Hakim, uh, I believe there may be here, there are lots of issues at play here. There's Iran. Iran does not like Alawi. And so Iski and possibly Muqtad al-Sadr may find it hard to go with Alawi uh, if Iran is so opposed to him. The other issue, of course, is the question of debathification, which is a slur, a sort of a big, you know, uh, whatever it's called, a, a cross mark that has been put on Alawi's list, that he will come back, if he were to come back, he will bring the Baathis, an alliance with him would be an alliance with the Baathis. There's a psychological block there. Ammar al-Hakim and Muqtad al-Sadr have <coughs> both made very interesting noises about including, not only including al-Iraqiyya, but also going into an alliance with Iraqiyya. Ammar al-Hakim has repeatedly said, we can't ignore Iraqiyya. Muqtad al-Sadr said, if we can't have a breakthrough with... Uh, uh, with Maliki, we will go with Iraqiyya. That will be our, he, they will be our natural ally. Um, Maliki finds himself in a position where really nobody wants, wants him particularly. Everybody is opposed to him. And, and this has been at the crux of the problem. And of course there is the, the possibility, who knows, in politics everything's possible, of an alliance between state of law and Iraqiyya, Maliki and Ayad Alawi. And, and the Kurds, of course, will always be part of any such alliance. Um, that I find the least likely, uh, partly because, of course, they're both competing to be prime minister, but even more important is the uh, perception by Iraqiyya and the Sunni members in Iraqiyya particularly that even though the debathification accusations were not necessarily triggered by <coughs> Maliki, it was fully embraced by Maliki, and that Maliki is continuing, and, and that the state of law and the machinery of government that he controls is continuing to hound these Sunnis with accusations of, of being Baathis and so on. So there is a very strong psychological resistance of the Sunnis uh, on Ayad Alawi's list to sort of consume, consummate a marriage with, with Maliki. Of course, uh, the other thing for Alawi himself, if you recall, he withdrew from government uh, in 2008, uh, pulled out some of his ministers who would who were agreed to leave, and in fact, there has been uh, a total absence of communication between Alawi, uh, the <coughs> Dawa Party, and Maliki uh, since 2008. Um, nothing, nothing of any substance has gone on. Um, so in a few minutes, if I may uh, yes. talk about what will happen, what Rusty asked me the other day, whether I was optimistic or pessimistic. I said I was cautiously pessimistic. <laughs> so, and it's because so much can go wrong. And, but, you know, some things can go right. There is a chance that things will go right, but a lot can go wrong. Um, the, uh, uh, the Kurds and Ammar al-Hakim particularly, Iski as a whole, but Ammar especially, have been trying to act as mediators and conciliators. And they have called, both Masoud and Ammar al-Hakim have called for roundtable talks uh, around which all four major groups, uh, plus the Kurds, uh, would meet. And, um, or, or including the Kurds, they would be the four. And to reconcile differences. Everybody agreed except Maliki. He does not want to agree. Um, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, 
uh, Iran certainly has uh, already hosted at the same time uh, groups of Iraqis. Iran was the first place that they went to uh, just before the election results were announced and just after. But they've also been making visits to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Turkey may step in with offers of mediation also. The problem is that these three important neighbors don't necessarily agree, won't, will not necessarily agree on what to recommend or how to mediate. Each one will have their own agenda. Each one will want to push for something. Um, failing an outcome that, you know, the, 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 the notion is that there should be a compromise candidate. Uh, Amal Hakim has said it is probable that neither Maliki nor Ayad Alawi will become prime minister and that we need to find a compromise candidate. Um, at some point, if there are questions about this, I can run through the names and, 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 uh, and we will demolish the, the chances <laughs> of each one of them. Uh, I have yet to hear of a really plausible compromise candidate, but they are going to have to come up with somebody. Um, so, you know, a miracle has to happen because if they don't come up with a compromise candidate who is acceptable to everyone or almost everyone, and if they do not form a government that really is truly not only inclusive, but it also is based on true power sharing and true sharing of the decision-making process, at least on the big issues, then I fear that there will be white discontent and that the group that is most likely to be discontented are the Sunnis and that there is really a prospect of increase in violence and that if there is an increase in violence, you see how this is going on, you know, a uh, chain reaction, um, that we may have a uh, state of emergency call. If this is before the formation of a government, I wouldn't be at all surprised if Maliki were to call a state of emergency in this interim period. Um, the other fear um, that I have, a strong fear, is that there is a strong risk of increasing power being becoming concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And we have seen this happen uh, over the last two and a half years, two years, certainly since, since 2008, uh, with a lot of exclusion, a lot of, um, you know, one party rule, a small group rule, and so on, with an arbitrary and a selective application of law and with uh, a continuing uh, compromising of state institutions. I think state institutions are already compromised and my fear is that they will be further compromised rather than rebuilt or built. Um, many political groups recognize this danger and they don't recognize it because like me, they are a Democrat and they're interested in freedom and human rights and rule of law and so on, but because they're interested in their own welfare. Um, they want to defend themselves against being marginalized, against being, th being thrown out of the political system. This is why I said they all feel these elections are important. It's, you know, win or die. Um, and so the political groups that are currently negotiating, being aware of this risk, are actually not only saying to Malik, you know, you can't be prime minister, but they're saying that whoever is prime minister, we're going to have to circumscribe the powers of the prime minister. We are going to have to define his authorities much more closely. We are going to have to have a system of true power sharing, true decision making, balanced authorities, because without that, we are going to sink back into the situation that evolved with the Dawa party after 2008. Uh, in, this may well produce less efficient government, but I think that is a, an acceptable price to pay in the short term in the interest of moving away, pulling away or minimizing the danger of s moving further into authoritarianism, uh, images 
of single party rule and so on, which are frightening a lot of people today in Iraq. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Rend, uh, for that, uh, for those insights. Uh, there were so many uh, issues that you just touched upon, and I know we're going to want to come back to you in the Q&A. Uh, the, re the reemergence of the Sadris, uh, the depathification, Im the impact of depathification, both pre, before the election and the lead up to it, and and still ongoing. Uh, the role of the neighbors and their interests, and, and we've seen all these, uh, the shuttling of political parties out to Tehran and to uh, Riyadh and so forth. And uh, I think that's a good point to turn to you, uh, Yost, for uh, your impressions about how this is uh, the implications for Kurdish Arab relations. For, um, for some of the things that you've written so much about in terms of reconciliation, in terms of the neighbors and their, and their role here. And if you could do so from the uh, podium that we'd, we'd, uh, the camera folks would, I, I know, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Rusty, and thanks for having me, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the International Crisis Group put out a report about the Iraqi elections before the elections just to um, uh, analyze the, um, the factors that went into the elections, and I think you may still find that useful. It's online, but I brought some hard copies with me um, to understand uh, what has come out of it. A lot of, uh, it's very important to understand the antecedents. Um, but I will not talk about that now and, and look more at the results. And I, I just want to figure, uh, sort of address some of the, um, the figures uh, that have come out um, and that Ran didn't mention um, to, to complement her excellent uh, talk, uh, and for a politician that was truly impartial, I'm very <laughs> impressed. Um, the, um, so far. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, also, I, I also wanted to compare the 2005 and 2010 elections a little bit, uh, especially on two issues. One is the participation rate. Um, and if we look, uh, because we, the accountability and justice, the so-called accountability and justice commission was mentioned, uh, and the debathification campaign and the disqualification of several hundred candidates before the elections and still ongoing. Um, the, uh, uh, the question was, uh, did this um, either uh, trigger a, a boycott among those targeted, especially the Sunnis, the Sunni Arabs in Iraq, or did it in fact encourage them to go to the polls? Um, and that, that is, well, clearly did not trigger a boycott. And uh, it may well, uh, though we need survey, po uh, polling sur uh, survey to, to find out exactly what happened, but it, it, uh, the, the turnout rate went up in two uh, critical provinces, one Anbar, uh, where turnout was 55% uh, in 2005 and now 61%, and in Nineveh and Mosul, uh, where it went up from 62 to 66%. Uh, overall, in the country, uh, the rate went down from 70 to 62%, so quite a decline, and in fact, this is true for all of the remaining 16 governorates participation rate was down, but in those two it went up. However, even if this was triggered by uh, sort of a sympathy vote for people who were targeted by debathification, the outcome, uh, compared, uh, comparison between 2005 and 2010, sort of along ethno-sectarian terms, is barely different. If you look at the, um, uh, the uh, United <laughs> Iraqi Alliance of 2005, the Shiite Alliance, it had 46.5% of the vote. Um, this time, if you combine the state of law with the Iraqi National Alliance, these are percentages of seats, by the way, um, you come to 48% plus 9%, so they went up by 2.5%. Not a huge difference. If in 2005 you look at Tawafuq, Iraqiyya, and Hiwar together, so that is uh, what Tariq al Hashimi's party, uh, Yad Alawi's party, and Salah Mutlaq's party, they had 80 seats, or 29 0.1% the uh, seats. This time, if you combine Tawafuq, which almost disappeared, and Iraqiyya, they come to 97 uh, uh, seats, which is 29 plus, plus 8%. So they went up 0.7 percentage points, very little, less than 1%. The, Kur the Kurds went down. The Kurds had 58 seats, uh, 53 for the coalition, and five Islamist votes in 2005, 21.1%. This time, they went down to 17.5%. Um, with only 57 seats, so in absolute terms, one seat less, but in, in relative terms, because the no total number of parliament seats went up from 275 to 325, uh, quite a decline. Um, and so uh, what we see essentially is 
the same results as in 2005, with one key difference, which is that the Shiite list broke up. And this is, accounts for Alawi's victory, uh, or at least uh, so far, provisional victory, uh, because we don't know what will happen with the recounts. And anyway, these results are provisional. But um, uh, had the Shiite list stayed together, uh, then together they would have had uh, 106, uh, 57, sorry, 59 seats, um, which is, uh, by the way, only four seats short of, a, of an absolute uh, majority, uh, and, uh, and would have far outvoted uh, Erafia. So uh, the, the key difference in these elections is that the Shiite list split. Now the question is, can it get back together? And Rant has already uh, addressed that issue, and I think, yes, they can, but without Maliki. Now we come to the very difficult issue of how to get rid of Maliki. Oh, how will they get rid of Maliki? Um, let's be clear about that. <laughs> Maybe a Freudian slip. Uh, and yes, it's astounding. Uh, the, um, uh, because Maliki is going to argue, rightly, that he uh, uh, obtained 620,000 votes himself in Baghdad, which is good for 20 seats in Baghdad. He, by himself, personally, obtained 20 seats for state of law, which is, gives him huge legitimacy and credibility. So he is not going to leave if he can help it. He's going to resist that tenaciously and with a great deal of justification. Um, his nearest competitors were Yad Alawi with 407,000 votes. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, very interestingly, Osama Nujaifi on the Iraqi list was 274,000 votes. Then Tariq al-Hashimi, the, the vice president, was 200,000 votes. And then Ibrahim Jafri is the fifth one getting more than 100,000 votes uh, with 101,000 votes. Everybody else has less than 100,000 votes. So, um, but, but Maliki is, is, is therefore far ahead uh, of, of, the, of the field and is going to uh, insist, uh, and this is what's going to create the deadlock that is, uh, or the stalemate, not that, that is going to uh, last for some time, I, I expect. Now, what is the role of the Kurds in this? Uh, Rant already mentioned that the Kurds are, first of all, mediating, and second, will be part of any coalition government. I think that's right. Um, the question, are the, the Kurds still kingmakers? I would say, well, you know, in 2005, they clearly were the kingmakers, and now the Sadrists have uh, uh, superseded them in that, that, that role, if, in fact, there is a single kingmaker. But just as it takes, you know, uh, X number of, of votes to get through a health care bill in this country, so it will take... X number of votes to get a government formed in Iraq. And in the end, with coalitions breaking down uh, to create this larger coalition, um, individuals may become kingmakers. Uh, and all will depend in the end on what kind of deal is struck between them. <coughs> now, the Kurds uh, come into the game with uh, clear disadvantages. I've already mentioned one, which is that they have fewer seats than they had last time, especially in relative terms. Um, and um, this is due to the fact, uh, not that they ha have declining uh, uh, popularity, because uh, it seems that uh, you know they, they um, have been they, the turnout is, is relatively larger in Kurdistan than it is in other parts of Iraq, um, um, and and and, uh, and, so, and so it's not attributed, attributable to that. But uh, the fact that they had fewer seats uh, uh, to contend for in uh, the Kurdish governorates. And that is because in the drafting of the electoral law in, uh, in uh, 2009, uh, they were assigned fewer seats based on trade ministry statistics uh, indicating population growth over the last four years. They resisted the fact that they were being given less, fewer seats, um, but um, in the end, in order to prevent another veto, um, the, uh, the Americans called Barzani and said, listen, um, you know, you've got to concede and we'll give you something in exchange. And in exchange, Masoud Barzani was given a visit to the White House, which took place in January. So that wasn't a very good deal. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, to the Kurds it was symbolically incredibly important, but in, 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 in terms of absolute power, this is, this is uh, pretty tough. And Barzani came under a load of criticism from just about any, everybody including, uh, you know, across the board, KDP, PUK, Goran, everybody, for having uh, conceded uh, this, this point. Um, and now uh, they are stuck with that. The, um, uh, the second thing is that the Kurds themselves were divided uh, this time with a, uh, the new change movement, Goran, 
emerging as a, as a, a serious competitor to, to the POK in particular, less so to the KDP. Uh, and Goran ended up with eight seats against the Kurdistani coalition uh, 43, Kurdistani coalitions KDP and POK. Um, and what is interesting is if you look at the individual candidates, I mentioned the five leading candidates. Well, the sixth one is the first Kurd. And he is Latif Mustafa, or Judge Latif Mustafa, who is an independent running on the Goran list in Suleimaniyah. So the first Kurd in this list of top vote getters is a, an independent Kurd running on the Goran opposition list, uh, list in, uh, in Suleimaniyah. And if you then go further down the list, number nine on that list is Khaled Shwani, who is a POK politician, a member of parliament in the, in the outgoing parliament, uh, and very popular in Kirkuk, where he won his seat. Um, so he, he came in as the second Kurd. But then if you go down the list, the third Kurd, number nine on the total list uh, of, of all Iraqi uh, MPs, is Ali Bapir, an Islamist in Erbil. And the fourth one is uh, Ozeir Havid, also an Islamist of a different Islamist party. Uh, and, so, and the KDP comes, comes in only on the th in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 17th place. So the KDP politicians weren't particularly popular. However, they got the most votes within Kurdistan. But they, their votes were spread out more. And in the end, the KDP won, uh, v, um, sorry, the figure is here somewhere, uh, they won 31 seats versus the POK 12 to make up for the 43 for the Kurdistani coalition. The Goran did, made eight, the Kurdistan Islamic Union four, and the Kurdistan Islamic Group two, for a total of 57 seats. Um, now, while divided, they're also unified in, the, in, in their sort of strategic vision of uh, what Kurdistan should uh, fight for in Baghdad. Um, however, there is a problem, and that is goes back to the Goran question. Goran is willing to be part of a unified front in Baghdad as long as they get redress for what they feel is a deep uh, and injurious injustice that occurred last year before the Kurdish uh, regional parliament elections in July, uh, when uh, in the run-up to which the um, POK in particular uh, ousted a number of Goran affiliated uh, uh, Kurds from uh, civil service positions. They fired them. And Goran has been clamoring since then for these people to be reinstated, quite ri rightly, I think. And in fact, Masoud Barzani has already said, yes, this needs to be solved. We understand this is a serious, is a legitimate problem. We will fix it. But the thing is that Talibani hasn't really made any uh, move yet to, to, to address this as the head of the POK. Uh, and so Goran is still balking, is still saying we're not part of this uh, front in Baghdad. Um, and so potentially, though I think this will be overcome in the end, potentially um, the Kurds will go into Baghdad uh, divided. At the moment they're negotiating among themselves and they're, they're still their, their common program is not known. Uh, it's not agreed anyway. Then um, the Kurds had another setback in Kirkuk itself uh, where um, in 2005, in the two January 2005 provincial elections, they obtained um, the vast majority of seats, 26 out of 41, uh, with, the, with the Arabs getting six seats and the Turkmen's nine seats, so 15 against 26. And since then, uh, the Kurds have dominated local government in Kirkuk. Now, these were not provincial elections. In fact, the provincial elections in Kirkuk have been postponed indefinitely. Uh, but it is interesting to look at the national elections and to see how the, the, the various parties did. And what we see this time is that Irapia had half the, almost half the votes, but at least at half the seats. Six out of 12 seats went to Irapia, the other six uh, to the Kurdistani coalition. So only two groups won seats, uh, the Irapia and the Kurdistani coalition. If the Kurds had hoped that through demographic strength they would bring Kurdis, uh, Kirkuk into the Kurdistan region, then certainly they've had to scale back their aspirations because um, now, uh, if, if, if a vote such as this is any indication of demographic numbers, and this is a questionable <coughs> assumption, but they all make it, then uh, they have only 50%, and therefore their quest to bring Kekuk through a referendum uh, is, is complicated. Um, now, why did Araki have uh, so many votes in Kirkuk? We have yet to see, and of course the Kurds are now calling for a recount in Kirkuk as well, uh, taking the Lead, uh, the, the, the example of, of Maliki in Baghdad. Um, and so who knows what may still change. Um, but one key difference is, is that um, the Turkmen of Kirkuk decided to vote for essentially, uh, I shouldn't call them Arab lists, but uh, to, to not vote for separate Turkmen lists as they did in the past. 
And so we see that Iraqi, two of the vote winners, are, are Turkmen. Um, and in fact, the top, the top guy is, is a Turkmen. And, uh, and he got the most votes in Kirkuk. And so um, th this, this uh, uh, unification of the Turkmens and Arabs in Kirkuk for the purpose of this vote, um, uh, mar not marginalized, but uh, pushed back the Kurds uh, to, uh, to an equal number of seats, six against six. And finally, the Kurds have suffered a setback as well in changing uh, policy of the Obama administration, or I should say the shift between the Bush administration and the Obama administration on Kirkuk. <laughs> Uh, and, and really uh, following on the heels of the release of the UN report last April, a year ago, um, which suggests an alternative uh, uh, solution to Kirkuk and a, di and, and, and a different process that would almost inevitably lead to a solution that is not the one that the Kurds pursue. Um, and with the Obama administration putting itself behind the UN report and the UN method of resolving this question, um, the Kurds have lost a, a, a sponsor in the White House that was allowing them to proceed uh, with creating facts on the ground in Kirkuk that would lead to uh, Kirkuk uh, falling within the Kurdistan region over, uh, over time. So the Kurds have realized this, uh, though they're still resisting <coughs> realizing it in some way, um, but um, uh, we'll have to deal with this as they proceed to raise the issue of Kirkuk in the process of forming a new government. Now, the Kurds will no longer be the kingmakers, but will still play an important role because the fact is both sides, be it sort of the Shiite side and the Alawi side, uh, need the Kurds first to mediate and probably to be part of their government uh, in order to continue to mediate between them and to, to create some balance. Um, uh, and, of course, their seats are needed as well. And so the Kurds have some bargaining power, but the Kurds themselves are also quite eager to be part of the new government. And even though they prefer Alawi, they will settle for, for anyone. They perf really per probably don't want Maliki, but then I think it's very unlikely Maliki will be prime minister. So um, they, will, they will push certainly for one of the alternatives that also Rand mentioned uh, that is going to come up in the coming m weeks and months. So, um, but because they also want to be part of this government, that sort of diminishes their leverage. And so they will have to play a very careful game of putting their demands on the table. Now, in the past, they put Kirkuk sort of front and center. We want this government that we are joining to implement Article 140 of the Constitution. And this is all solemnly signed by all the sides. And of course, nothing happened in the last four years. Nobody implemented anything on Kirkuk. So with the withdrawal of American troops from Iraq and, and, and really the departure of the Kurds sponsor from Iraq. Um, in any case, whatever deadline, even if, a, if one is agreed, it will not be implemented because the deadlines in Kirkuk, uh, the record shows deadlines don't work. Um, process is everything um, and it's going to be extremely slow. Um, now the Kurds realize that too and so they have a number of other demands that may contribute to their overall drive to eventually bring Kirkuk into the Kurdistan region. And th they include maybe holding provincial elections uh, in Kirkuk. I'm blocking that process. Um, so in other words, some kind of commitments to that process moving forward. Um, but also relating to the oil uh, question. And the Kurds may seek uh, um, uh, the agreement of the government, of which they will be part, to pay uh, the companies that have been exploiting uh, oil in Kurdistan and, ex and exporting it for some time last year. And there are some other demands they can make along that, those lines. So finally, because when Masoud Barzani visited the White House, he was told at the time that he should not make Kirkuk a make or break issue in the forming of a new government, I think that the Kurds will be fairly uh, flexible players in the forming of a new government. They will not hold up the formation of a new government. And that's a good thing. And that brings us back to, well, what is then uh, going to uh, endanger the new government, and, and that's exactly where I agree with, with what Rand said. Uh, we're going back to the, the Maliki Alawi uh, conflict uh, over the vote count, the legitimacy of the results and of any future results, uh, and the difficulty of uh, forming a government that uh, is uh, w between parties that are headed by figures that are not acceptable, in Maliki's case, by uh, the people he will need to bring in. Um, and uh, in another case, by Alawi, who is going to have a very difficult time forming a uh, majority government 
based on at least 163 seats. I know I was supposed to talk about the neighbors. I'm not going to. <laughs> Good. I was just about to make the same mistake. It was too much of me to ask you to try to cover all of that <coughs> in, in one uh, presentation. So thank you very much, Yost. And uh, there's uh, a lot there that I know we're going to come back to in the Q&A. Um, okay. I, I think Marissa mentioned that uh, an interesting point about, the, 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 in her view, the necessity to disaggregate the question of of uh, U.S. withdrawal from uh, government formation. And I think that's a, a good segue to Jeremy, uh, whom I've asked to give a, a brief uh, a comment on, um, on the U.S. role here and U.S. policy options. Um, and I think Ren will also have some interesting things to say on that uh, later as well in terms of the role the U.S. has played or not played or should play uh, in this uh, transitory period. Jeremy? Thank you. <coughs> Uh, well, glad to be uh, part of this uh, uh, event, and um, uh, it's been a privilege uh, to be uh, associated with USIP um, uh, for the last uh, two or three years. Um, the task I've been given uh, is uh, to uh, speak uh, most briefly um, in the interest of leaving uh, the most time for questions um, and offer just a few observations trying to put this in the perspective of the broader U.S.-Iraq relationship. And I, I think I'd just like to make uh, three uh, sort of broad brush points uh, on this. Uh, first, about uh, progress that's been made in Iraq since 2003. Uh, second, about uh, political transitions uh, and uh, learning from uh, uh, past interpretive mistakes that we've made uh, over the past uh, uh, seven years. Um, and finally, about the value of, uh, of taking a long view uh, with respect to Iraq. Uh, I'll, I'll speak most briefly uh, on progress. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, I think everyone uh, is aware of uh, and could be measured uh, in many different ways. Um, but I think it's worth, nonetheless, uh, making explicitly. Um, uh, I think that there has been uh, uh, a significant and steady uh, and sometimes uh, underappreciated uh, amount of progress in Iraq. As I look back on, uh, on uh, the evolution of, uh, of uh, how, how uh, Iraq's uh, governance and uh, uh, political and security situation uh, has progressed uh, since 2003, um, uh, the, the overwhelming theme, uh, in my view at least, is uh, a steady growth of uh, effective sovereignty. Uh, uh, we, we should remember uh, uh, how uh, low uh, a basis uh, uh, we started with uh, in 2003, uh, where there was uh, uh, literally no formal sovereignty uh, and uh, 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 m much less, uh, very, very low expectations on the part of the U.S. Um, and indeed uh, on the part of, of, uh, of, of the Iraqis. Uh, for uh, uh, whether Iraqis would be in charge of making decisions about uh, about uh, their country, um, um, and but we have seen steady progress uh, uh, away from that um, and towards uh, sovereignty. Uh, obviously, the the transfer of sovereignty in 2004, um, uh, uh, the government, the the last elections in 2005 that have already been discussed, uh, and uh, the uh, the, the governance uh, rule uh, under the, go the government finally formed in 2006. Uh, it has been messy. It has been. Uh, it, it has never been uh, exactly what uh, uh, what the U.S. Uh, uh, or the coalition uh, would would uh, uh, would have liked exactly to happen. Um, uh, but uh, but but uh, the, the the steady growth of sovereignty uh, has been there. Just to, to give one concrete example of this, uh, uh, as a former uh, uh, Treasury person uh, and, and, and indeed former uh, 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 legal advisor uh, to Iraq in its debt negotiations, I have a kind of finance perspective on this. Um, and so when I think about uh, Iraq uh, exercising sovereignty, I think about the growing role that uh, uh, Iraqi uh, budgets uh, have played uh, in 
uh, making decisions about, uh, ab ab uh, that, that have to do with Iraq. There was a time not so long ago when uh, the vast majority of American attention was focused on us spending the $18 billion Iraq Reconstruction Rehabilitation Fund, uh, spending U.S. money uh, uh, based on our best understanding of what uh, Iraq needed. Um, but uh, that moment uh, is, is uh, now long in the past. Uh, Iraqi uh, uh, revenues uh, have uh, recovered. Uh, uh, it has been the case since uh, late 2006 at least um, uh, that uh, uh, Iraqi money is what matters, and Iraq makes decisions about how to spend that money. And it took us a little bit of effort, but gradually uh, the U.S., uh, uh, realized that uh, if we continued to focus just on what we could do with our resources, we were going to be uh, less significant. But that if we uh, uh, focused our efforts uh, 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 around the idea of helping Iraq uh, uh, execute its money towards its priorities uh, as evidenced by its budgets, both at the national and subnational level, that that was a much more effective way for us to work in partnership with Iraq. Um, and I think that that was uh, I think that that is a sort of microcosm of the broader issue of, uh, of the gradual assertion of sovereignty uh, uh, over the past, uh, over recent years. My second big point is uh, about uh, the, uh, the nature of political and governmental transitions uh, and learning from past mistakes. Uh, I, I have a, a very vivid memory uh, of being in Baghdad in, in the summer of 2006, which was a bad summer, as, as, as mm -hmm. you may remember. And uh, having uh, someone come in to, to see me who I had worked with uh, on, on Iraqi matters for uh, a couple of years, a very senior partner in charge of the Middle East practice of an international accounting firm, uh, an Egyptian national who uh, knew the region, who uh, knew something in Iraq. By this time, he'd already been working uh, in Iraq uh, for, uh, for a number of years. And he suggested to me that uh, although in 2006 it looked like the sky was falling, that in fact one of the factors uh, explaining uh, the, the profound challenges at that time were simply transition problems that there had been an election in 2005. It had taken until April and May uh, of 2006 to form the government, doing the same process that we're describing here. Um, and by this time, the government had been formed, the minister had been named, but uh, you had a situation where uh, the ministers uh, had never worked together. You had ministers who had just been appointed who uh, didn't know their ways around the ministries, uh, who uh, had no habits of uh, collaborative work uh, what we would call here in Washington uh, interagency uh, uh, work. Um, uh, you obviously had a, a high degree of, of distrust, um, but uh, some of it was uh, the sheer practical challenge of a new government taking office. And I think uh, those of us who have lived here in Washington um, uh, for the past couple of years maybe have a, 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 a you know a, a slightly better appreciation for the inherent challenges of transition. Transitions are difficult, uh, and they often result in, uh, in uh, an immediate loss uh, of efficiency and the appearance of, uh, of uh, things not going the way they are, the, the, the way they should be. Um, uh, but, but that was not an interpretation. I mentioned this, uh, be, uh, this, this conversation in 2006 because it had never occurred to me uh, from the perspective of Baghdad in 2006, that some of what was going on was not extraordinary, profound uh, 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 failure to govern uh, uh, of Iraq, of the special circumstances of Iraq, but just uh, run-of-the-mill political transition problems that every country that tries to uh, uh, engage in a peaceful transfer of power um, goes through. I, I think there's a broader point here, uh, which is that uh, one of the terms that we that we uh, w was in wide use in 2006, and indeed in 2003, and 2004, and 2005, and even as late as 2007, was the idea that what we were experiencing in Iraq had been uh, nothing less than state collapse, state failure. People talked about Americans talked about. Uh, 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 arriving in Baghdad and being shocked to discover that there was no there there. Uh, uh, 
And I would like to suggest that that, that was, uh, was an interpretive mistake by us. That in fact, uh, that, that, that wasn't, there were all sorts of things that were profoundly going wrong, but, uh, but it, was not, uh, 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 it was not fair to describe it as state failure. And the best uh, uh, argument against that uh, is the fact that uh, uh, by late 2007, early 2008, uh, when I uh, returned in another capacity, uh, by which time the security situation had started to improve, the, the, uh, the, the military surge and other factors uh, had, had improved, uh, produced improvements in security, uh, uh, I think many people were, sh were very surprised to see the Iraqi government functioning much better uh, in 2008 than anyone ever imagined in 2006 or the previous years. Uh, 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 Iraqi civil servants were uh, meeting uh, and making decisions. Iraqi political leaders were making decisions, not always exactly the decisions that we, uh, that, that, that we wanted uh, on exactly our time frame, but decisions uh, that reflected Iraqi priorities about what was, was uh, most important uh, to resolve at that time. And uh, it wasn't the case that in 2008 the state had suddenly been formed that it hadn't existed in 2006 and 7, and that it had been created uh, as a result of, uh, of, of some uh, external uh, intervention. I think a much more plausible scenario is that the state had, uh, had been there um, and had, in effect, uh, uh, been driven underground, if you will, by the security, uh, the, 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 the profound insecurity uh, and the uncertainties uh, and uh, the improvement in security had established a condition, uh, to use a, a, a counterinsurgency term, that enabled the state to reemerge. Um, and that is a very uh, uh, chastening uh, uh, observation to make, that we, were, we could be wrong about something as uh, fundamental and profound as to whether the Iraqi state uh, had failed to exist for a number of years while we were there uh, looking as closely as we could. Um, and to me that suggests that, uh, that uh, we need to be very careful about, uh, uh, about seeing, uh, about looking for the right things and not rushing to conclusions. So that brings me to my final point which is about the value of taking the long view uh, with respect to Iraq. I think with the possible exception of 2009, uh, Every year since the U.S. has been in Iraq has brought a crisis that uh, has tempted us to think, and often, and we've often uh, uh, given into that temptation, to think that we, the U.S., has to do the expedient thing in order to get the situation under control. We have to spend uh, uh, our money uh, and uh, 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 increase the degree of involvement. We have to sort of take uh, a more active role um, in making sure that things turn out the way we want them to turn out. But I think we have learned a couple of things about, about that uh, temptation. Um, uh, first, uh, the expedient things haven't always worked. In some cases they have. I don't want to suggest, uh, I, I'm not making a, a blanket statement here, um, and I think that the military surge's contribution to improving security uh, is, is clearly exhibit A, uh, of something that did uh, uh, have a, a useful, if indirect, uh, approach uh, in the sense of establishing a condition, as I mentioned. But in many cases, the things that we, the, the expedient things that we tried to do didn't work. Um, and by contrast, the flip side of that is that non-expedient things, things that didn't seem expedient to us, like Iraqi sovereignty, like Iraqis making decisions about what they wanted to spend their money on, on what time frame. Uh, uh, those things happened anyway, even when we tried to, to, uh, to, to, to move it in a different direction. And so I think the question for us thinking about, uh, uh, about the long view is, uh, is not whether the state of affairs in Iraq now or three months from now when government formation is still uh, going on or six months from now when levels of violence ha have increased uh, to some extent uh, because uh, continued political uncertainty uh, and, um, um, uh, and, and we are tempted to, to say uh, uh, the wheels have come off it again 
we have to reconsider uh, the strategic decisions we've, we've made uh, uh, about what our long-term relationship with Iraq should be. Um, I think the question is not whether it's ideal, but whether there's enough of an intersection between uh, our interests uh, and uh, Iraq's interests and priorities for us to work together on some uh, 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 modus vivendi, if you will, uh, in partnership where we uh, uh, support, uh, support them, uh, Iraq doing uh, the things that, uh, that the two uh, countries can agree on. Um, I, think, I think that this long view has been particularly difficult, uh, a particularly difficult thing to achieve uh, uh, for much of the U.S. Uh, time in Iraq, um, but uh, I think that uh, with with some some effort uh, we have uh, 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 with with some uh, effort on on the Iraqi side uh, and on the U.S. side, uh, we have we have achieved something closer to it, uh, and uh, and I and I recommend us continuing to keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeremy. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. I, I think uh, uh, the reminder of, of, of the inherent complexity in transition processes can never be uh, made enough, especially when we're so sort of, you know, concentrated on, on one as, as complex as this. And the point that you make that the political process in Iraq has matured, even if it, even as it's grown increasingly complex, is a, is a very good one. I think we're going to go right now to, uh, to questions. Uh, please line up. We have two microphones here. We'll take, I think the best way to do this is to take uh, two questions at a time, one from each side. And if you could resist the understandable temptation to ask more than, question, more than one question at a time, um, that would be much appreciated. And I think we have, Joyce, we have this room for another half hour, right? Okay, good. So we have plenty of time. Sir. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is... If you could uh, identify yourself, too. Yeah, yes, sorry. my name is Raid Mohammed. I'm a private citizen, but I played a major role in the surge uh, in my meeting with President Bush in 06. I uh, perhaps was the, the only person that was able to, to convey to him the dynamics in Iraq when everybody else failed. But for the sake of the United States Institute of Peace credibility, I think you guys need to allow one of the al-Maliki, from the, the camp of al-Maliki, to at least be present here because otherwise it will look like it's an al-Maliki bashing platform. Not that I care for him, not that I've ever met him, nor I care for him, but it obviously looks like this was a platform to bash al-Maliki. And the slip of the tongue sealed it. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You want to hold on that uh, question. I'm sure Ren will want to respond to that. And we take a question from this side. Yes. Um, good morning. Good Rashmane morning. Ghori, National Endowment for Democracy. It was excellent, actually. Um, I disagree with you. It is excellent a presentation. I have one, two comments, one question. I'll keep them in two minutes. First, the comment for Jeremy. It, what goes in Iran stay in Iraq. And that's for the international policy and the future. And for Rand and Marisa, I have one question. Uh, you know, what is the integrity and, and, uh, and integrity of the US UN after they lost two battles in the last two months? The first battle they lost is justice and accountability. They lost it for Iran. The second battle they lost, the recount, which the outcome, if it comes, it's not to stay at it is right now, then we are in big trouble because there is no credibility <laughs> for both. For the uh, yachts, for the Kurdish things, you know, KDB didn't do so. They're, they were targeting grassroots. They understand the election law really well, similar to the Cyrus. They know they can get seat, and that's much important more than getting 600,000 for one candidate. And that's where the Cyrus win against the ASCII. If you go to the popular vote, they almost ASCII has more than the Cyrus, but they end with 18 seat, not with 40 seat. So just my comment, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, in, t in terms of addressing your point earlier, uh, uh, I will just say in response to the point that you made about this being a Maliki bashing or, or tended to, uh, negatively towards Maliki at, the, at his expense, um, I have to say that uh, 
uh, you know, in, uh, in putting together the panel, any appearance of that is my fault alone. I think that Renda Rahim, though she's a member of the Iraqi list, has been an extraordinarily objective commentator for quite some time on these issues, and we're yeah. delighted to have had her. Well, we, we can. I understand. I am. Well, I okay. Well, we, we will. We will. Uh, I don't know. I think I might. Uh, uh, we might. Uh, what I think we'll do is we'll have a sidebar afterward and let you address this directly to Rand, if I may. Um, and in terms of uh, the other question, the other question I had a couple of comments to make. I think one was about uh, Iran's role, and the second one was about whether the UN's integrity had been compromised in this process by the failure uh, to stop debathification. Uh, justice accountability process, and uh, on the question of the recount. So um, the, on the Iran question, that was, was that directed to, um, why don't we direct that to actually Yost? What's the Iran question? <laughs> I think the, qu the question I, was. I said what's the Iran question? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me frame that in, in the context of the question is, what would you say is uh, the role that, that Iran is playing now? They've actually had some interesting comments from senior uh, Iranian leaders about the importance of including Arkia, uh, and so there was some moderating uh, uh, comments out of Iran. Um, what's your sense of that, uh, Yost? Yeah, I'm not an adherent of the view that uh, Iran determines everything that happens in Iraq. I think their, their influence is limited. Um, it's limited by the, uh, the, the fact that the United States still has a lot of influence. It's limited by the fact that Arab states have some influence, that Turkey has some influence, and influenced by the fact that there are very few people in Iraq who like Iran or trust Iran or want to make any deal with Iran if they can help it. Of course, they can't really help it, and this is the problem, because Iraq is very weak. And so Iran has inordinate influence for that reason, um, but that, re that, that influence does have clear limits. And I think it is limited both by what Iran wants in Iraq, which is a relatively friendly uh, place that holds together, um, um, and the fact that Iran doesn't have any true friends in Iraq and therefore has to balance between the various actors, it's going to go for a Shiite alliance if it can, but very tellingly, it was unable to keep the United Iraqi Alliance together or to reconstitute it in the run-up to the elections. It broke apart, which led to the problem we have now, a problem, it's a, it's a, it's a good problem to have in many ways because it, it shows the openness of the system. But, uh, but, but the conflict we now have between Alawi and Maliki. So, um, so the Iranian influence, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, overstate it at all. The, the fact that uh, Iran now has called for an inclusive government, uh, which is also the US position and the Saudi position and the position of all the politicians that, that have spoken out about it, is a good sign. And it's again showing that Iran cannot simply have its will. Now what is going on behind the scenes, of course they're trying to manipulate, no doubt. Uh, but whether they will succeed, that's the question. Thank you, Yost. Um, uh, on the, on the I think the, I'll entertain the second question that you uh, asked about the role of the UN because I think it actually is a good mm -hmm. one. And Ren, perhaps you could address that. Has the, has the UN played a, 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 the role that it should have? Has it been uh, played a, uh, a proactive enough role in your view in this process? Um, I, I think those are two very good questions. Uh, Given what happened with the justice and accountability and what happened with the recount, um, I think uh, Abdurrahman Jabouri poses cardinal questions. Uh, what is the appropriate role of the UN? And indeed, is there one? And is there one for the US in all of this? The UN, I'm sure, will say that its role is entirely technical and that it does not make policy decisions, it does not make political decisions, and does not influence the process in any way. The UN did in some ways uh, support IHEC at times when IHEC was really under the gun and was under a lot of pressure. Um, and the UN, and, and especially um, uh, Ad Melkert, came out at appropriate moments, mm -hmm. including the announcement the day when the results were announced. And it was announced that Iraqia had won. This was a critical and rather dangerous moment for IHEC. And the fact that uh, 
Ad Melkert came out and um, uh, gave a, a, a little sort of supportive speech, was very supportive of IHEC. But other than that, I think the UN has tried to steer a very straight and narrow course. Um, the US, the situation is somewhat different. The US um, certainly doesn't want to be seen influencing the political situation. It was accused, whether rightly or wrongly, I don't know, uh, by the Justice and, and um, Accountability Commission of trying to influence the appeals uh, panel. Uh, and I don't know if the US did try to do that or not. I know they were meeting with everyone, but that doesn't mean they were presenting, putting pressure. The US finds itself in a very awkward position. And again, the US really doesn't know whether it has leverage in Iraq. I think US policy is very uh, nebulous on this subject. Uh, US um, officials that I have met since coming back uh, from Iraq just about 10 days or two weeks ago are sort of waffly <laughs> on the subject of what US policy is in Iraq. Is there a US policy? Is the relationship of Iraq, of the US to Iraq, similar to the relationship of the US to Britain, for example, mm. uh, or to France? Or is it of a qualitatively different nature? And I think the U US officials like to talk about Iraq being normal. Iraq is not normal. I mean, we're moving towards normalcy, but by no stretch of the imagination is Iraq like Britain or like France or not, or Canada. Uh, so, but I think the US officials try to evade these issues. And similarly, they try to evade issues of, you know, do we have leverage, don't we have leverage, do we have a horse in this race or whatever the, the expression is. So good questions, I don't have answers for them. Well, that's a, a pretty good pr uh, proxim proximation. I suspect that if through the questions, we're going to want to come back to that, and the other panelists are going to have something to say about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm Wallace Hayes. I'm an independent consultant. And my question I open to the whole panel. And my question is, I heard uh, various panelists say that the Kurds did not like Maliki, the Iski did not like Maliki, and the Sadras did, like, did not like Maliki. And my question is, is from a political sense, is he dead man walking? And, and his supporters just haven't realized that yet because he's actually, he's the person who split the Shia alliance. And further to that, do you see a danger in the recount that he's trying to achieve by other means, non-democratic means, what he couldn't achieve through the election? Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Jeff al -Rukabi. I'm an Iraqi graduate student at Georgetown University. Um, I met your father not too long ago in Baghdad. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. Um, <coughs> I have all the respect um, and praise for USIP, and I think this event today was great. But I do uh, believe that uh, I'm sure, despite her best interests, the analysis that Mrs. Rahim Rahim presented is very much tilted against me and pro Iraqi, And I'd like to present what I think is cool academic analysis, <laughs> um, uh, presenting a different picture. Well, uh, so it, it's going to have to be very, very brief, if you would, and, and, and with a question. And in very it. briefly, and I will end with a question, very briefly, <laughs> pre-election, <laughs> pre uh, Ms. Rahim presented debathification as uh, infinitely benefiting Maliki. I argue the exact opposite. Ahmed al-Chalabi and Father Lillami, both in INA, were behind uh, debathification, and in fact, it undermined Maniki's attempt to reach out to the Sunnis, and thereby weakened him, forced him in a corner where he had to choose either to be seen as mm. someone who was pro-Ba'ath and therefore loses his support in the South and Center, or to lose the West. And that's exactly what happened. That's the first point. In terms of the actual election itself, during the election, I actually think that what we saw is a great shift in support for Maliki's Dawah party. And if you actually add up the votes, in the provincial election, uh, the Sadrists, Iski, Jafari, Fadila, if you add them, they got more votes by far than Hezb al So in, the, in these elections, Hezb al has actually done much, much better. They're in a much stronger position, despite uh, the, the claim to the contrary. And my final point is about the post-election that, that we see uh, happening. 
I don't think we should take the comments of politicians too seriously. All this anti maliki talk, I think, is just a jostling for better positions. And let me quote an interview from Muqtada Sadr in Al Jazeera recently, in which he claimed that Allah has offered him half the cabinet in, in return for his support. He says he rejected, and he said in that interview, Maliki hasn't offered him something like that. It's almost as if he's asking, give me that money and I'll give you, I'll give you the support. My question to Mr. Rahim is on regional influence. Uh, we've all heard about the concerns regarding Iran. And uh, in an interview with the BBC, Dr. Yad al uh, argued that Iran was out there against him, that it wouldn't invite him or his list. Now, of course, in the last few days, we've all seen that al Araqiya has gone to Iran. I'm hoping that Ms. Rahim can explain to us why Araqiya chose to do so and what negotiations behind the scenes took place with Tahran. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Some very good questions that I know Ren is going to want to uh, to uh, respond to. But let me first um, offer the first uh, question uh, to Marissa. Would you like sure. to take handle this one? That yeah. had to be uh, was a question related about uh, all this talk about uh, about the various uh, the Kurds, uh, uh, certainly the Sunnis and other factions being uh, and and the Sadris included mm -hmm. being anti-Maliki mm -hmm. in this process. Um, what's your thought about that? Um, and the recount as well, I think that was yeah. part of the question. No, I, I don't think that Maliki is a dead man walking. He did, he <coughs> personally garnered the most uh, votes out of any candidate. There's no question that he, his movement uh, is, is powerful and, and does uh, have grassroots support. I, th I think the resistance to Maliki is, is most evident at the level of political elite who have seen uh, the irrigation of power uh, in the post of the prime minister, uh, are concerned about some of the actions and some of the uh, uh, behaviors that, that Maliki has taken uh, in recent years. And that's where the resistance comes. So I, th I think that um, he's still a very powerful force, and I don't think he's a dead man walking. And I think that there is a question of, of um, you know, what opposition would look like. Um, could state of law actually, um, if it's not in the government, and again, this is all very uh, up in the air, but you know, could state of law actually be a very viable opposition movement? Um, could it be a viable long-standing movement? And I, and I think that there, there are a lot of legs for state of law, but again, there's this, there are hurdles to Maliki personally um, because of resistance amongst the political elite who have, who have seen uh, some of his actions and are very wary about it. Uh, so that's my sense. Thank you. Uh, Yost, I think you probably have a, some thought on this as well as you made some comments about how the Kurds regard the Maliki coalition and state of law. Well, the Kurds <coughs> will deal with anybody. Um, because for them, the importance is to be in Baghdad and to advance their own interests in Kurdistan. And in Kurdistan. So um, they're, they're pragmatic in that sense. And, um, but I, I think if, if they, they had the chance, they would not want to have Maliki as the prime minister uh, simply because of the past experience with him. Um, but the bottom line is they will deal with anyone. But I think uh, um, Melissa is right about, Marissa is right about the... Um, uh, you know, Maliki having no, no elite support, and this is what counts, and he has quite a bit of popular support, and that's what, he, of course, he's going to use in order to, to get his position uh, back. And I, I suppose that uh, the, the reason why he, Maliki is, is pushing so hard to get the, the recount and, uh, and to, get the, uh, you know, his, uh, to get a victory here is, n is not because he, he, um, he thinks that, in the end, there won't be a government uh, that, uh, that that excludes uh, state of law. I think I think it's quite likely that state of law will be part of a, of a new government. It's very difficult to exclude them. Uh, in fact, because if you look at just the numbers, I think it's very difficult for mm -hmm. Alawi to form a government. So it's going to revert to uh, Maliki anyway, even if 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 uh, Alawi is given the first chance to uh, uh, to to form a government. So, but the question then becomes: Will Maliki's coalition partners accept him as prime minister. And I think this, this is a, a real difficulty because at the elite level, those people don't want him. And so that is going to be the big fight. And the question is, will uh, Maliki's own uh, supporters in Dawa and in the state of lawless more broadly, will they back him up or will they go to an alternative candidate? And all the debate in Baghdad right now is about alternatives. Mm. And I think that might actually get back to the question of possible compromise candidates that Ren mentioned. Mm -hmm. Can I just yes, sure. Have, um, sure, Ren. A couple of words. Um, <coughs> I think that what we're saying about Maliki not being um, uh, favored as a prime minister, as an ex prime minister, uh, is uh, very much in the press. I mean, what we're saying 
as what is reported in the press, and particularly Muqtada Sadr, who has been extremely opposed to Maliki and even to the Dawah party as a whole. Uh, so it's not just a personal opinion. Uh, you can check it up in, in the papers. Uh, I do not think, I agree, I don't think he's dead man walking. I think he still has a lot of power, mm -hmm. a lot of negotiating capability. Uh, but, you know, he has, uh, he has obstacles. Um, also, I did mention that Maliki did not ins instigate the debatification process, but he benefited from it enormously, and it's still going on. And finally, yes, the Dawa is in a stronger position now um, after these elections. It has moved from strength to strength, strength since the provincial elections. And, and, and part of the reason is the, the advantages of incumbency. I mean, you've got the tools of the state in your hand. Uh, you, the st you know, whether it is the, the army, the police, it's uh, the, all sorts of tools that people who are in opposition or who are not in government anyway um, don't have access to. It's quite simple. Um, about the, the recount in Baghdad, there's no doubt in my mind that it's being done because um, Aliki feels he wants uh, uh, he, he wants more, vote, mo more seats in parliament. That's why. Mm. Um, otherwise, because there are, by the way, um, there are questions about the votes in all of the, of the provinces. Uh, you mentioned Kirkuk, very strong example, and an example that works against Iraqiya, by the way. Mm -hmm. Iraqiya has asked for re recounts in Najaf and Basra and a few other provinces. They picked Baghdad. It's, n it's indicative. Yeah, I think the worry uh, that you just kind of outlined is that this is going to lead to a snowballing yeah. mm -hmm. of recount yeah. requests, yes. which yes. are going to delay uh, yes. the whole process. Or, even or worse. not. If it does not lead to m other recount requests, it could be just as damaging politically because it will be seen as a decision by the court mm. that simply serves Maliki's uh, political desires but is ignoring uh, uh, and, and sidelining the, the wishes of other political groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think, um, yes, sir, I'll take your question. <coughs> Maurice Chahed from the Washington Institute. Mm -hmm. I have a question, one for Jeremy and one for M Marisa. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, how do you look at uh, the production of the Iraqi oil seven years after the war, it's still below the level that it was at the time. Don't you see it as a failure of the Iraqi, of the Iraqi government from the economic point of view? And Marisa, uh, you touched on the killing of al-Baghdadi and al-Masri. Uh, if we look at what happened according to the media, the Iraqi forces just surrounded the house where those two were there. They needed the American help in order to attack to a hel helicopter rocket and kill those two people. How can you put the readiness of the Iraqi army four months before August when it's supposed to go, the American number of forces supposed to go for uh, to 50,000 uh, soldiers? It's, to me, it's like the way it w they killed uh, Tarqawi four years ago through a rocket. So the Iraqis still need uh, the Americans for help, and they don't have an air force. Well, I would you. just on your comment on, your, on that, it, it's not as though American forces are going away. There's still going to be a sizable force that's staying, so I'm not sure it's, it's not as though every American soldier is pa packing up and leaving uh, as of August 31st. Uh, touching so. on the readiness of the Iraqi mm -hmm. forces uh, in terms of sure. not, uh, such, such an operation. Sure, okay. Well, um, okay, let's, let's actually go ahead and, and get some answers to those, and we'll, we'll move on. Jeremy, do you want to take on the question about briefly about Iraqi oil? Yeah. Because it's not as well, it's just germane to the topic I, I of elections and post-election yeah. government formation. I, I, I certainly wasn't, wasn't suggesting that, uh, um, that that should be regarded as a, a success or um, uh, a justification. Um, it, it's, it is definitely the case that part of the benefit um, that Iraq has realized in terms of, uh, of increasing resources and uh, uh, material base for sovereignty was the result of high oil prices uh, through, through 2008, uh, which together with some recovery of production and exports uh, produced a real benefit to the state. Um, but I think that, that uh, what we've seen in the last year or so has been 
the uh, Iraqi oil ministry uh, uh, having worked through a process that was much slower and more and, and different from what uh, the U.S. has envisioned at various times um, is laying the groundwork, uh, the, the, the medium and long-term groundwork for uh, the kinds of agreements with international oil companies that will, uh, uh, you know, in the medium and long term, result in a very significant increase uh, in production and exports for the benefit of Iraqis. Thank you. And actually, I think as the tie into to the election uh, government formation question, it's interesting that I think Sharistani, the oil minister, has been mentioned at least in some circles, as a possible compromise candidate, which is somewhat intriguing. Um, Marissa, do you sure. want to take the question about um, American withdrawal? Yeah, on the question of American withdrawal, I think it's worth just taking a moment to, to discuss what September 1 will actually look like. Um, what, what U.S. forces are doing now, they're already conducting stability operations. They're already partnering. They're, they've always been partnering with the Iraqi security forces, and they're doing so in an advise and assist capability, where the Iraqis are in the lead. They are conducting the cordons and they are conducting operations. So th not much is going to change uh, from now to 1 September. The biggest one is the numbers. And, and in terms of combat forces, you're looking at 50,000 uh, troops going down. They've already transitioned from, from the combat counterinsurgency mission to stability operations. So that's, that's already been ongoing. Um, with regard to the operation itself, that was a very high level uh, operation. So I, I think that there should be some distinction made between Iraqi capabilities on a uh, daily basis and this uh, special operations force uh, raid of the top al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, figures. Um, but Iraqis were in the lead there. And I think that you are right to point out that there is a need for continued uh, training and assistance, uh, particularly with um, the Air Force, the Navy, logistics, sustainment. There's no question. And that's something that the Iraqis also understand. We had a number of engagements uh, with uh, senior Iraqi officials. Um, but it's not going to end 1 September. This is going to continue through the end of the security agreement uh, at, at, for now, uh, through uh, the end of 2011. So there's no question there are still issues where the Iraqi security forces need assistance. They've come a tremendous way from where they, from where they started. Um, and n it's also worth an understanding what's, what September 1 means. It's, it's 50,000 uh, U.S. forces will remain, and they're going to conduct the stability operations mission that they're already conducting uh, right now. Right, and the anti-terrorism activities is a major part is of Is a major mission, part of stability operations. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, good morning. This is a really good panel. I, I'm Bob Dreyfus with The Nation magazine. Uh, my question is really for, for Yost and, and for Rend, and it has to do with uh, Iran's relationship separately with Maliki and with Saddam. Um, we know these guys don't particularly like each other for a long time, and Back in 2007, at least the people that I talked to said that the General Soleimani from the Revolutionary Guard went to Maliki and said, okay, go after Sadr, smash the guy, and then we'll come in and broker a deal, which is exactly what happened in, in Basra. Um, and obviously Sadr has not <coughs> forgiven Maliki for that, um, nor I suppose does Maliki particularly, you know, want to apologize for it. Um, so my question is, What's the relationship that Iran has, first of all, with Sadr, who's been living there now for three years, right? Who's he hobnobbing with, and who does he talk to, and what's that all about? Uh, it's amazing to me how it's dropped out of the press and uh, investigative reporting and everything else. And then second, with Maliki, um, as Joe said, he may not, Iran may not love him, whatever. It is kind of hurting cats for the Iranians with these guys. But my question is, I mean, I've been told that Iran has massive covert relationship with, with Maliki, not in, in the public sense, but that key people very close to him are outright Iranian agents, I mean, not just friends of Iran, and, and so forth. And I, could, I don't want to go through the details. So what, 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 never mind whether they can make a deal and what the election, call it, what, what's the, Iran's relationship with these two individual characters like? Uh, there's uh, some good questions there. Actually, I had not fought, forgotten Mr. al Rukabi's question, lest you thought I had, and I think it dovetails nicely, too, in terms of your question about Arakia's recent sort of uh, traipsing to Tehran as well. So perhaps, um, do you want to take first crack, uh, Rand, on this question about uh, Iran's <laughs> <laughs> role and relationship with yes. uh, Sadr, uh, Sadr, Al-Sadr yeah. and uh, Maliki? I, I have to say that I think if anybody thinks I'm here speaking on behalf of Iraqia, I, I hope nobody's under that misconception. Mm. 
Um, well but said. In any, in any case. Um, right. Um, to, Muqtada Sadr has been in Qom for three years. And the question is, how much I influence does Iran have over his political decisions? Is he a free actor? Can he make decisions as he pleases? It strikes me as very unlikely that if he's sitting in Qum, and some people even say that he's under house arrest in Qum, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, it, I can't believe that Iran would allow him to stay in Qum for three years and not have a say in the decisions that he makes. Uh, but to what extent, we don't know. Um, the recent, I've often suspected that the recent referendum that the Sadris held for prime minister was something that the Iranians came up with in order, in order to put the fear of God into Maliki. <laughs> I mean, this is purely hypothetical or theor theoretical. Um, so, and, and then again, how much influence does it have or what are the relations between Iran and Maliki? Um, I have certainly heard that there are um, behind the scenes relations and trips uh, from Maliki's group to Iran, uh, communications which are not uh, uh, open to the public. I know of some myself personally. But is it more than other groups in Iraq? I mean, we know some other groups among the Kurds, for example, have strong relations with Iran. Iran is a major player in Iraq, and I think we would be very wrong to think otherwise. And so long as we have a weak state, and I'm not talking just about a weak government, but a weak state, then we're going to have a power vacuum, we're going to have a state that is vulnerable to Iranian or to anybody else's influence. But Iran is quick to rush in there, more so than any of our other neighbors. Iran feels that it has more at stake in Iraq than, say, the Turks feel or the Saudis feel. It's, Iraq is a big deal for Iran, and it's going to walk in every time it sees an opening. On the issue of Maliki versus Muqtada Sadr, my um, analysis is that Iran does not get into details. In this, in this way, as, as, as affects the elections. Iran feels that there are only a, a couple of legitimate Shia groups from which the government should emerge. Those are the Dawa or SOL. It may or may not like Maliki, but it doesn't matter. It is the INA, Sadr and Iski. It is, as far as Iran is concerned, it is those groups, those two groups, from which the future government should emerge, including the, and which should decide the shape of the future government. Now, there may be an Iranian veto on this or that person, but I think it's more important for Iran to restrict legitimacy of governance within the groups that it can deal with mm. or that it deals with the most. Mm. This is my personal analysis. I have obviously no, um, no documentary proof. Mm. Yos, do you want to elaborate on a little bit, especially if you broaden it out a little bit, because uh, we've noticed the Saudis have taken a strong, <clears throat> much stronger interest, and there's often a comment uh, that the Gulf Arab states have been have been absent from the scene in Iraq in many respects, or uh, playing a somewhat passively aggressive role that, say, Saudi Arabia has been playing. What's your what's your what's your own uh, assessment of the stakes for them and how they're engaging right now? Well, they are not very good at engaging, that's clear. Um, though Saudi Arabia, by inviting, well, I, I, I think Saudi Arabia showed again that it doesn't engage very well by failing to invite Maliki to, to Riyadh. I think that was, yeah. was a blunder. And um, they should have done what the others do, and is to invite everybody, and to have a, an open discussion with, with, uh, with everyone. Um, the Saudis have a total blind spot on Maliki and, and will not deal with him. And I think, I think that's, that's a, that, I don't know, fatal, but I, I think it's a strategic error on the Saudi part because in the end, whether it's Maliki or someone else uh, from state of law, uh, you know, or, or, or the, the broader Shiite bloc, um, you know, they're going to have to deal with them in the long term. And 
uh, and they certainly don't, are not laying the groundwork for it. So I think the Saudis have, have, are particularly poor at, at dealing with Iraq. Um, mm. and, and it's true for the other Arab states as well. Um, Syria is doing it mostly by, in negative ways. Um, the, only one, the only clever players, other than Iran, and I fo totally agree with Iran's uh, analysis on this, but the, the only ones who, who are clever are the Turks. And, and they also are talking to everyone. Um, their stake is not as great as Iran's. I agree with that as well. Uh, but they, they have made sure to keep all the doors open. I think the bottom line, they would prefer Alawi as prime minister, but they will deal with any alternative as well. Um, and, they're, and, and they are doing it simply because they are concerned about the Iranian influence and they want to curb it. And they do it by also talking to everyone, just like Iran is. Uh, but their influence is less in Baghdad, clearly. Uh, but they have certain things to offer that Iran doesn't. For example, you know, better produced goods. Um, mm and in a, a channel to the, to the, to the, to the Western markets, um, uh, energy pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, Tur Turkey is playing a role. Um, I would just, uh, on, I, I really don't think that Iran has any favorites among the Shiite politicians. I, I really have not seen any evidence that they favor one over, or the other. They're always playing one out against the other. And, uh, and I have to say, in terms of, you know, Muqtar al maybe being under house arrest in, in, uh, in uh, Iran, I don't know, but I remember being in Iran in 2002, before the uh, invasion, and meeting with, with Mohammed Bakalakim, Ayatollah Mohammed Bakalakim, and, and his uh, uh, lieutenants. Um, and, and they were captive of Iran, or but a proxy of Iran, or, or you know, supported by Iran, equipped, financed, uh, everything, appointed. And uh, they hated Iran. And they were, they were making it clear, as I was there in Tehran, they were making clear how much they hated the Iranians. Hmm. And that really struck me. And that was before they came back to Iraq and then had to defend themselves against the accusation that they were Iranian proxies. These guys were not Iranian proxies, but they couldn't get rid of the stigma. And that is suffered... And they've suffered a lot from that in, in popularity. Uh, so, but I, and I think that's true for for all of the Iraqis I've met. Uh, you know your father as well, and others. I, you know, there are sympathies toward Iran, but there are sympathies toward others as well. And there is a, it's a recognition that you have to deal with with the neighbors, especially Iran, because Iran is going to be there forever. And Iran has a, a it doesn't have to have a long memory. It has a 20 year old memory. It remembers the Iran Iraq war. It will never forget that. Um, and it's going to protect its strategic interests in, uh, in the region, uh, and it's going to make sure that whatever emerges in Iraq will not hurt its interests. And that's a legitimate concern. Mm. Thank you very much for those comments, uh, Joseph. Uh, I think the flicking of the lights is a good symbol that we're coming up on the hour, <laughs> hour so it's apt. So we have time for one more question, and then we're, we're going to wrap up. Yes. Yeah, go continue your question. My name is Isan Kassad, CSF International. Um, I think we have covered uh, most of the uh, formation of government uh, scenarios, uh, with exception that we have neglected one scenario that may be uh, important. Uh, that's a formation of uh, Iraqi and uh, Kurd, is that will bring them uh, close to 163. So uh, I would like to hear if there is any potential uh, possibility for this uh, coalition to be formed, and especially that Kurd have announced, I mean, he made, they made a clear statement that uh, they are in favor of uh, Shia coalitions uh, than Iraqia, and they justify that by being not uh, primal, not against uh, Mr. Alawi, but against some figures in Iraqia which they described as anti-Kurdism. Uh, is Iraqia taking, uh, I mean, it's again, is there any potential uh, possibility for this formation? Um, I would like to hear that, and okay, thank you. Well, um, thank you for your question. Um, I, I, to emphasize Ren's point, she is not here on behalf of any political party in Iraq. Um, so with that, uh, um, I, I don't know whether which of you would like to take that on. Marissa, perhaps you first? I can start one. Um, I think anything is possible. Um, and, and we're at the beginning of the process, so it's very hard to say with certainty. It's certainly possible, although there are a couple of um, factors to be considered. Uh, the first is there are certain elements within Iraqia that the uh, Kurdish parties have have said that they are less um, that are less acceptable that are not acceptable. Thinking particularly of the um, the JP um, bloc um, and other uh, anti-Kurdish blocs within uh, Nineveh, Kirkuk, and uh, Diyala. So th there is that factor, and it's it's not insurmountable, but it is something that might affect um, which elements of Iraqia. Uh, might or could ultimately uh, ally with the Kurds. Um, if that happens, though, I think you'll see some other uh, 
groups perhaps uh, entering into the alliance. I, I, again, anything is possible. Um, with what Talabani said about the uh, preference for the Shia alliance, um, I think it's also worth noting that other uh, statements were made in the last couple of days saying, you know, that that's one thing, but we are still at, in the early process. We will look at other groups. So I think that, y that you, you know, it's worth noting that there was some um, statements s um, in response to, uh, from Kurds, in response to what uh, President Talabani had stated. The groups perceived, well, the, well, groups that are perceived as anti-Kurds that have made statements, uh, okay, but again, uh, again, no, 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 they're, they're, No, I think I think it's a lot about perception. I think there's there's a lot of politicking that's gone on before and after the election. Um, you, you notice different changes in tone from certain actors uh, before and after the election. So I, I, again, it's it's always hard to say because there's a lot of posturing. There's a lot of posturing going on. Question clarification, right? Um, any coalition has to achieve not only uh, the magic number of 163. It has to include the Kurds. It has to include significant Shia groups, and it has to include significant Sunni groups. A, a, uh, an alliance between INA and the Kurds um, alone is not going to work because they need the Sunnis. An alliance between Iraqi and the Shia alone is not going to work because they need Shia. Um, so those three elements are essential. Now. Having said that, I think the Kurds have repeatedly said, and Iski has repeatedly said, that they would like to see a government formed out of the four major political groups, the Kurds, the INA, Iraqiyya, and SOL. Okay. So the general direction is to include all four rather than to exclude. So this is, this is what has been said. Uh, in the press and said repeatedly. And I think that is what will in the end happen. Yeah, I'm sorry we don't have more time, Ren, to talk about some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, potential sort of compromise candidates that you refer to. E oh, e e but we're also moving towards the, uh, we're clearly, as you've, uh, you suggested, it seemed that things are moving towards the grand coalition, um, perhaps end state. Uh, Yost, do you want to give us a, a final comment? Well, ju just the, on the, the bare <coughs> numbers. I mean, Iraqi has 91 seats. The Kurds have 57. So together they have 148, which is far below the, the, the magic number. So it's, even if they tried that, they would still have to bring in some others, and it's going to be very difficult. But I don't see a, an agreement on Kirkuk and the disputed territories before the government formation. And short of that, I don't see key elements of Iraqi list uh, aligning themselves with the Kurds in a new government. I just don't see it. And if you look at uh, uh, Hewar, the dialogue uh, front uh, of uh, Salah Mutlaq, they have, uh, we, we're still trying to get the numbers, but uh, about 17 seats. And uh, Nujaifi's group, uh, the Iraqiyun, have, have 18 seats. So let's say 35 seats. It may differ a little bit, but 35. So you, 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 dis you, you take the 35 off the 91, you come to 56. Then you add the Kurds, so it's 113 it becomes a huge challenge to, to, for, to form a government. So I, I, I simply don't see it, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's because, because of the disputed territories. These are the people who live in the disputed territories, the Kurds and the and Nujaifi and, and his followers. So they are not going to come to, to terms before the formation of a government. It's just, it's going to take a long time. And on that note, I want to thank uh, all of my panelists. Uh, I want to thank uh, my co-host, Marissa, uh, as well, the Institute for the Study of War, Juice, Rend, and uh, Jeremy as well. And thank you all for coming.